Hey, uh, hello everyone. Um, so today uh, we have a, a guest lecturer. Um, we'll, uh, introduce this is, uh, there he is, uh, Professor Jeremy Gordon, who's gonna be um, um, talking about echo planar uh, imaging, another sort of similar to fast spin echo um, or the fast gradient echo that we talked about in the last couple of lectures. Uh, echo planar imaging is another uh, way to, to, to accelerate our, and, and also like parallel imaging, it's another way to go faster and acquire our data uh, more quickly. Um, before I have him get into the lecture, um, let's see the one announcement I have for today is that uh, uh, homework nine uh, has been posted. That will be due uh, next Monday. <clears throat> and um, um, covering uh, the parallel uh, imaging, compressed sensing lecture, as well as fast spin echo. Um, and do note that um, there is one of the um, compressed sensing problems. It's uh, um, we provided some starter code for that because um, it's a, a bit of a, a challenging programming uh, exercise. And so Faye set up some starter code where you, uh, Alec, uh, where in the comments there's sections um, uh, where you can fill in what you need. And, and for that, recommend you refer back to uh, uh, Nick Dwork's uh, lecture from last week, which is I'm now both posted in the uh, in the YouTube playlist, <clears throat> and also um, have a PDF copy of of the notes that he made during the lecture, as well as a, a document that, that he provided that describes some of the theory he presented. Um, and the other uh, uh, change uh, Faye and I just discussed with that is that uh, she will probably be holding. Uh, some office hours on next Monday to so to address any uh, final uh, homework questions before it's due that that evening. Um, so, are there any other uh, announcements or questions people have before we get into the lecture for today? Okay, um, with that, I'll hand it over to, to Jeremy. Thanks, Peter. Okay. All right, you guys can see the, uh, see the slides? Yeah. I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that's a yes. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, so my name is, is Jeremy Gordon, and I'm an, an assistant professor in the Department of uh, radiology and biomedical imaging. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'll be talking today about the, the basics of EPI, um, common, common artifacts um, seen in these types of images and their app and its specific application. Um, we go through, please feel free to interrupt at any point uh, during this lecture if you guys have any questions or would like um, further clarification on anything we've discussed. So before we talk about EPI, I want to just briefly recap how a, a basic or standard Cartesian gradient echo sequence works. So here we have our um, standard RF pulse um, combined with the slice select gradient to tip um, some longitudinal magnetization into the transverse plane in a particular slice. We have um, pre-winders on the, the readout and the phase encode of the X and Y gradients to move us to um, the edge or the KX and KY max K space. Then we have our readout gradient to, to traverse a single line of K-space. After which we typically spoil the magnetization and we, we repeat. So we play out the same slice select and same readout gradients and we just sort of move or notch down the phase encode gradient strength to acquire the subsequent line of K-space spoil. And we repeat that all the way through to encode our entire um, 2D or 3D K-space. So for our Cartesian approach, um, it's standard to have one RF pulse. Uh, it gives us or acquires one line of K-space. 
So our scan time for a single average um, and for a single 2D slice is simply the TR times NY, or the number of phase encodes um, in, our, in our image. Um, EPI, in contrast, is a very simple, yet I think powerful idea. You know, the idea here is that what if instead of spoiling the magnetization after acquiring one line of case space, we essentially refocus and acquire multiple lines of case space with a multi-echo approach. So here, instead of just doing a simple um, readout and then spoil or leave the magnetization, we use this oscillating gradient um, on the readout or the GX axis to encode multiple lines for multiple echoes within a single TR. So with one RF pulse, instead of acquiring one line, we now acquire multiple lines from multiple echoes, uh, the number of which is determined by this um, ETL or the echo train length. Um, and the important thing here is that this reduces our scan time um, by this factor of, of ETL. So what that means is now we can really accelerate or speed up our, our acquisition. And in principle, we can um, encode an entire uh, K space with only a single, single RF excitation. So this is commonly referred to as, as single shot ETI, where here we have one RF pulse and we encode the entire K space all the way from uh, positive KY to negative KY max. In this case, the, the echo train length is equal to NY or the number of, of points in, in the Y dimension. This gives us really the, the shortest possible scan time you can achieve. Um, here it's essentially just the TR times the next or the number of averages you have for your, your 2D slice. Um, and for 3D, this would be multiplied by the number of um, points in the, the second phase encode dimension. Um, alternatively, you can run this in what's called a multi-shot EPI, whereas uh, in, in one RF pulse, you only acquire one segment of K-space. So here, K-space is broken down into to three segments. You have this solid, a thick black line, a thin black line, and this dashed one. And here, instead of acquiring all of K-space within one excitation, you acquire um, one third or one segment of it. As we'll see, as we talk about in future slides, this gives us a trade-off between um, pure speed um, and also um, sensitivity to, to artifacts due to T2 star um, signal decay and chemical shift that we'll, we'll talk about in the second half of this lecture. So here our total scan time is still a function of TR and next, but now is determined um, or modulated by this, this ETL or the number of, of shots or segments it acquire, requires to, to encode encode K space. So like we talked about, um, the data are encoded with a, a bipolar or oscillating gradient. This is really the, the key to, to understanding how this, this process works. So let me try and pull up my annotation here. All right, so I don't have a stylus, so kind of bear with my, my lovely drawing skills. Um, but if we have KX and KY, what this is telling us essentially is we, we move from the center of K space all the way to minus K, KX and minus KY max. And that brings us right here. And we have this oscillating gradient, which moves us left and right from negative to positive KX. And in conjunction with these blip gradients, lets us use this multi-echo acquisition to encode some or all of K space. So let's see, we're, oops, I lost my pointer. There we go. So what we're doing here is we move us from minus KX, this direction. And this blip gradient tells us to move up one, one blip or one line of K-space in KY, and then we read out in the opposite direction. We move up again another line, and we rinse and repeat for either um, the entire K-space or some, some small segment of it. So, the key point here too is that we can read out on only the, the positive or the positive and negative lobes, which will have some impact um, on the, the image quality as we, we talk about in, in a few slides. But the idea here being that 
for symmetric EPI, you read out on both the positive and negative lobes. So you read out sort of left to right and then right to left. Whereas with, with flyback, we're, as the name implies, sort of flying back or, or rewinding the magnetization before moving towards the next line of K space. So here we'll acquire sort of left to right in this diagram, but we'll rewind the magnetization before blipping up and acquiring the next line with the same polarity. Here, the big difference um, results is due to the, the extra time it takes to so-called fly back to the, the minus kx or the beginning of k space in the kx dimension. Um, and as we talk about when we discuss some of the artifacts, this makes us more resilient to some, but also makes us more susceptible to, to others. So one important uh, variable to, to understand or be familiar with is this concept of, of echo spacing, which is defined as the intervals between, between echoes or, or lines of k-space and sort of the blip or the k-y dimension. This is defined as this TESP or the echo spacing here. As you can see for, for flyback, it's, it's always going to be a, a longer duration or longer separation than for symmetric EPI because you have to sort of fly back and rewind before you can encode um, the next line of K-space. This has some important um, drawbacks here because things like you know, T2 star decay and, and, and blurring will, will limit us to, to lower resolutions and explains why we can't really um, just have uh, a very high echo train length and readout for you know, hundreds of milliseconds long. And this larger echo spacing leads to um, an increased echo time. So we're gonna have potentially lower signal due to things like T2 star decay. Um, it's gonna result in, in some blurring again due to the T2 star related issues, um, but will also lead to, to image distortion and chemical shift artifacts. So really the, the crucial aspect here to, to get across is because this is an extended sort of multi echo readout, we're acquiring multiple lines within a single excitation. We now have this sort of effective bandwidth in the, the phase encode or the KY or, or blip dimension as well. Um, this really is the critical point, and as we talk about in future slides, this is what separates EPI from your standard, you know, conventional spoiled gradient echo. Because we have this multi echo readout, things like um, chemical shift, off resonance, and T2 star decay will now accumulate in both the frequency encode as well as the phase encode dimension. Um, and this will result in some you know, unique artifacts inherent to EPI that we'll discuss in the second half of this talk. Now, it's important to note that, that EPI can be acquired as either a, a gradient or a spin echo uh, sequencer approach. Uh, and the contrast that you obtain really depends on how um, the magnetization is prepared and acquired. So if we wanted to obtain T2 weighting um, with an EPI sequence, um, how would we go about doing that? Does anyone have any, any thoughts or suggestions there? Okay, you, everyone must be muted, that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll give you guys the answer here. <laughs> So it's the same as what you would do for any, any, any standard sequence. You would have to add some sort of you know, refocusing pulse. <clears throat> so you'd have your standard slice select excitation, then you play out this 180 degree refocusing pulse, and then um, you have the same echo planar readout as normal. That would let you sample on uh, or obtain T2 weighting um, instead of T2 star weighting. For, for T2 star, we would just simply remove this 180 degree pulse and we would acquire immediately after the, the excitation. So there, that would be more, more of a T2 star weighting. Um, how about T1 weighting? Um, what could we do or how would we obtain uh, T1 weighting with a EPI sequence here? <clears throat> 
Well, you could either um, have a, a high flip angle and short TR, um, or more commonly, you could have some sort of um, inversion recovery or IR prep module prior to the, uh, the initial excitation here to uh, prepare the magnetization with the right contrast. So to, to, to recap, the total scan time here is no longer directly tied to the number of phasing codes N, Y, um, but rather to the number of shots it takes to, to fill up your, your K space. This results in a significant time savings, um, making EPI both fast and, and a lot more robust to motion. So here in this sort of um, standard example, you have a, a volunteer who's moving their head from the, the left to the right. And with EPI, because you can acquire data on the order of you know, uh, hundreds or even less than 100 milliseconds, you're able to essentially acquire sort of snapshots during this motion. And you're able to sort of capture um, the brain on the, the sort of the scale of the motion. Whereas with conventional GRE, because that would take seconds to acquire, all this motion essentially blurs out and gives you um, very non-diagnostic and, and, and non-useful um, image here. And because it's, it's so fast and because it's inherently robust to motion, it is, it's, it's a mainstay of, of, of clinical imaging, when, especially when you need to have very high temporal resolution, such as when you're doing functional MRI or for perfusion imaging, or when you would need to acquire um, lots of data that would just otherwise take a very long time, such as with diffusion-weighted imaging, where you have multiple B values in multiple directions over a 2D or even 3D space. Um, which would, would, would take, or would, would be much longer than you would have the time for with the standard acquisition. And we'll talk a little bit about diffusion weighted imaging at the applications part of this lecture. So before I go ahead and move towards sort of the artifacts that are in, inherent um, to, to EPI, this is kind of a good place to, to stop and, and take a quick break. So we've already introduced the concept of, of EPI, which is a, a multi-echo um, acquisition that sort of refocuses on the magnetization and uses that to encode multiple lines of K-space within a single TR. Um, before we go to the artifacts, are there any any questions or, or, or thoughts about um, EPI versus a standard gradient echo uh, before we proceed? Okay, well, if things do come up, feel free to, to, to chime in. Um, so the first artifact that I'll be discussing is, is chemical shift, um, which is uh, an artifact that you probably have already discussed in the context of um, you know, standard gradient or, or, or spin echo sequences, but we'll kind of reintroduce here and show why it's a little more onerous and, and, and problematic for EPI. So if we take the case of um, fat and water for proton imaging, here the, the delta F or the, the frequency difference is roughly about 400 hertz, 440 hertz at, at 3T. And here I'm giving some um, just basic scan parameters for a standard somewhat low resolution echo planar acquisition. So um, the first question that I'll ask here, and I'm gonna try and I can figure out how to do this poll, see if that will work is, first question I wanna, to ask you guys is which direction will have chemical shift? Um, let's see, let's try this. Will it be in the frequency encode dimension, the phase encode dimension, both of them or neither? Um, the poll answers are anonymous, so don't hold back, feel free to, to, to chime in here. So for echo planar imaging, we have two frequencies, we have water and we have fat. Um, which direction will we, will we have chemical shift? Will it be in the frequency? Will it be in the phase? Will it be in both frequency and phase? Will it be in neither of them? So I'll let you guys go ahead and answer here, I'll give you a couple minutes. I wanna vote, but I, I think I co-host, I can't vote, unfortunately. I'm disappointed. <laughs> you can type your answer in the chat, Peter. That way you won't be the anonymous one. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay, we got a good question. Two more, two more folks here. So feel free to to think about it a little bit. A um, little more time here. Okay, so it looks like the majority of, of people feel that it's uh, the chemical shift will be in the frequency and code dimension. Um, a handful think it will be in the phase encode, and there's one brave person who thinks it's in both the frequency and the phase. Um, as we'll as we'll see, the the answer actually is both. EPI is is really unique in this in this aspect in that chemical shift will manifest in both frequency encode and the blip or the phase encode dimension. And that really is, is what sort of makes EPI a little more unique in terms of artifacts, but also why it's a lot more sensitive to things like chemical shift um, in, in B0 in homogeneity. And so we'll kind of work through this example problem and hopefully give you guys a better understanding of, of why this is. So for chemical shift in the readout dimension. Um, you can think of it in a number of ways. Um, the way I tend to think about it is how it's written here, where the, the position or the displacement that you have in, in a specific dimension, in this case X, essentially is the, the ratio of the frequencies. So the delta F from chemical shift, so water and fat being 400 Hertz, over the, the total bandwidth in that readout dimension. That gives you sort of the fractional shift and then multiplying that by the number of voxels in that dimension gives you the voxel shift, right? And so here with uh, the having a very high readout bandwidth, the, the chemical shift is, is much, much smaller than that. So we end up with um, shifts in the frequency and code that are essentially subvoxel or even uh, too small to be noticeable. Here in this sort of simple example, it's a uh, little more than a tenth of a voxel, which is something that you you're not going to really be able to observe. But let's think about it in the in the case of the the phase encode dimension. Um, for 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 when you prescribe your your imaging sequence, you physically prescribe a readout bandwidth, right? That's what we have here in this case, plus or minus two hundred kilohertz. Um, but for the the phase encode, it's a little little subtler. Um, how do we figure out or determine or even go about trying to figure out what the the effective bandwidth would be in the phase and code dimension? All right, so let's let's kind of draw my poor case space diagram again, right? But here we acquire one line of case space. And then we blip up and we acquire another one. And we do this, let's say in the case of single shot to make it simple, um, we do that for all the lines of case space, right? And so, you know, if we think about it just in terms of the, the frequency encode, you know, we, we're acquiring these discrete points along the readout and they're separated in time by, let's call it, TS, and that's just sort of, or it just is inversely related to the bandwidth in the X dimension, right? So the higher the bandwidth in for the readout, the shorter the, the sampling time is, right? But because we're doing this, this multi-echo or extended readout, we now have this sort of off resonance phase accrual that's occurring in both the readout dimension but also the blip or the phase encode dimension. So now we have to determine what the bandwidth is and why. And we can do that analogously, right? So here we have sampling in, in X and we have this uh, sampling in, in Y. And this is just the echo spacing that we were talking about on the previous slide. Um, so here, this is not a value that we, we directly control. It's determined by uh, 
the readout bandwidth um, and the gradient performance and the, the scan parameters like field of view and matrix size that we, we prescribe. Um, but this is what determines what our bandwidth is in the phase encode or the Y dimension. And because this is sort of acquired in a much longer and a much slower basis, you can see that the bandwidth in the phase encode is going to be significantly smaller, right? Here we're acquiring um, data with a sampling time on the order of, you know, a few, a few microseconds between each point, which gives us a very, very large readout bandwidth. But here in, in this example, the echo spacing is, is much larger than that. It's, it's an entire millisecond, which means that instead of having a, a bandwidth of 200 kilohertz total in the X dimension, our bandwidth in the Y dimension is significantly smaller. Here in this example, with an echo spacing of one millisecond, our bandwidth is, is only one kilohertz. So it's, it's dramatically smaller. Um, so we can do the same sort of analysis here, right? Where we're looking at the, the fractional or the relative shift between, or difference between the delta F from the chemical shift and the bandwidth on the Y. Because bandwidth and echo spacing or sampling time are inversely related, we can write it out this way, where it's just sort of the delta F times echo spacing times and the number of points in the Y or the phase and code dimension. And because our sampling time is, is so long and we have such a short or small bandwidth, we have not only chemical shift in the phase encode, but it's, it's a significant uh, amount of, of shift. Here we have a subvoxel shift that's almost gonna be negligible. And here we have a shift that's almost going to be half our, our field of view. So instead of being sort of an object that would be centered uh, at isocenter here, it shifted almost halfway halfway around the, uh, the field of view here. And so this is a, a, a as you can imagine, a, a big problem for, for EPI, right? Any sort of off resonance um, will, will cause these sorts of shifts and they're gonna be very pronounced, most pronounced in the phase encode of the blip dimension. So I kind of want to reiterate this just by drawing kind of this, this these simple or basic case-based diagrams again, because this really gets at the, the crux of the heart of how why or, or why EPI is so fast, but also why it's so much more sensitive to things like chemical shift in, in B0 and why it's most sensitive in the phase encode dimension, not the frequency encode like you would typically think um, from prior lectures. So, you know, here again for the simple or Cartesian example, you know, we're acquiring one line in the same direction for each TR. So we're acquiring one line and we spoil and then we Next line, we move down one segment of, of KY and we rinse and repeat, right? So each line is its own entity and we don't have any phase accrual in the KY dimension because we're not doing this multi-echo or extended readout. So we only have essentially the sampling time in the X dimension, which is still just the same, you know, one over bandwidth, but because each line of case space was acquired um, independently or separately, you know, it can be, uh, my mouse. it can be thought of as essentially as having um, the, the same sampling time in, in KY. So if we think at it here, the Delta T is essentially zero because it was acquired at effectively the same point in, in, in time and case space. So we don't have any phase accrual in Y, and it's only in X, which is why you have chemical shift artifacts to manifest in the X or the frequency and code dimension for um, your standard gradient and spin echo Cartesian sequences. In contrast for, for EPI, again, it, it's because you have this multi-echo or extended readout. So here we're acquiring multiple lines in a single excitation 
So now you have this, again, this discrete sampling time in the frequency and code dimension. But because you're acquiring multiple lines of, of K space, you have this phase accrual along both the frequency and the phase as well. And so now you have this implicit bandwidth in the phase and code dimension that's determined by your echo spacing here as well. So the, the key point to, to take away here is that with, with EPI, you have um, this explicit bandwidth in the, in the frequency encode, but you also have this implicit, very small bandwidth in the phase encode of the blip dimension because of your multi-echo extended readout. And because the, the bandwidth in the phase encode is much smaller, all of the artifacts related to T2 star and chemical shift and geometric distortion will primarily and predominantly manifest and be apparent in the phase and code dimension for, for EPI related acquisitions. Okay, so in this sort of simple so a numerical Shep Logan phantom here, we have water and fat as sort of two discrete objects that are acquired independently. But in reality, we're going to have um, water and fat not be independent. They'll be in the, the same image and they'll essentially be overlapping. So here in the case of the brain where you have um, lipid and fat predominantly in the, the subcutaneous tissue around the skull, you now have this sort of fat ring that will kind of overlap your your proton image, making it um, rather difficult to, to be diagnostically useful and can obscure some some smaller subtle features. So practically, um, how do we how do we deal with this chemical shift artifact here? Right? Does anyone have any any thoughts on what we can do to um, either make this this shift? smaller or to try and come up with ways to, to account for or remove it altogether? Are there any thoughts? Okay, well, like we just talked about, right, the the, the shift is going to predominantly be in the, the phase encode or the Y dimension because of the relatively long um, echo spacing or sampling time in that dimension. So to reduce that, one way we could do that is by um, increasing the readout bandwidth, which would implicitly shorten that, that echo spacing and would make the um, mag magnitude of the shift smaller. Um, we also could reduce the echo train length or increase the number of shots that um, would also reduce the magnitude of the shift. How about some ways that we could think of to maybe either remove or, or maybe not excite the fat signal in the first place? What are some approaches we could take there? Um, can we use inversion recovery to suppress the FET signal? Yeah, so inversion recovery is a, a great suggestion, and that's one way that we could do it. Um, are there any other thoughts? So one approach that we could take um, is this so-called chemical saturation or fat saturation. Um, here it takes advantage of the, the, the concept of RF pulses being either frequency selective or slice selective, um, either in the, in the presence or absence of a um, gradient on, on the Z axis. So what we do is 
you can play out this, this long RF pulse without any gradients, and it becomes frequency selective. So you can move the center of that RF pulse and place it over the, the fat resonance, selectively saturate the, the fat resonance um, prior to, to imaging. So when you do your standard slice select excitation, there's uh, almost no um, fat magnetization along MZ. So you tip nothing in the transverse plane and you can generate an image um, free of, of fat artifacts. And like Faye said, the other option would be uh, to do an inversion recovery prep sequence. Here we can take advantage of the difference in T1 times between water and fat. Um, fat tends to have a, a shorter T1. So by inverting the, the magnetization and waiting this, this TI time, we can essentially uh, know the, the fat signal by then exciting the magnetization when this fat is crossing the MZ equals zero plane. Um, in essence, it, does this, it, it accomplishes the same thing as, as chemical saturation by timing this uh, inversion recovery approach. We, we tip only the water spins down the transverse plane because the fat spins uh, have no net magnetization. Um, one other option we can take is a little more um, advanced, but it takes, it's this concept of these sort of 2D or spectral spatial RF pulses. Um, these pulses are selective in both frequency and space, hence the name spectral spatial. So they allow us to have essentially both slice selection for a specific narrow region of, of frequencies. So instead of um, having this conventional slice select profile where you just have chemical shift offset in, in the Z dimension, we now have these discrete islands of, of magnetization that we end up exciting. So by placing the, the carrier frequency on water, we can excite only the water spins and we don't excite any fat at all. But essentially these, these bottom three <clears throat> all accomplish the same, the same goal in that they selectively excite water and excite little to no fat signal. So you don't have um, any, you only have very small amounts of uh, fat in the image. So you have little to no chemical shift. Okay, <clears throat> so after chemical shift artifacts, the other or one of the other main main artifacts that we commonly have with with EPI are these these so-called Nyquist ghost artifacts, and these are really in, inherent in this symmetric EPI where we acquired data on both the positive and negative lobes of this bipolar readout, and these are due to um, timing delays in 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 B zero eddy currents that give rise to this alternating shift um, between the even and odd lines of K-space. And this results in, in Nyquist ghosting in the blip or the phase encode dimension. And these ghosts appear at the, at the sort of field of view over two or N over two, commonly referred to as N over two ghosts. Um, and they appear because of this regular discrepancy in this sort of even odd line um, on both the positive and negative lobes, similar to what you would see for, for pulsatility artifacts and resulting in the sort of half FOV shift here. So if the even odd echoes or lines of K-space aren't exactly overlapping at it, it's the same point in K-space, then we have these artifacts here. Um, even things as simple as a uh, sort of simple timing delay at the start of the first echo will propagate into to all subsequent ones and giving rise to these sort of Nyquist ghosts here when you do the Fourier transform. So ultimately, we acquired data that are sort of corrupted or affected by these um, timing delays and eddy currents that give rise to these sort of slight shifts in the even and odd lines of K-space, when ideally, we would want to acquire or reconstruct data that have um, the K-space sort of all, all lined up at, at, at K0, so these artifacts don't appear. Um, there are really two, two ways to, to address this. One is on the sequence side prior to the acquisition, and one is um, on the post-processing side after acquisition. So these artifacts really are, are tied to 
or in caused by this sort of alternating even odd um, line of case space with, with alternating polarities. So given that, what are some things we could do to either correct for this in post-processing or change on the acquisition side so they don't occur at all? So what we could do on the acquisition side is just replace the symmetric EPI with the, with the flyback gradient. So like we talked about, right, just briefly mentioned, these are caused, let me change color here, because we have this shift or delay between the even and odd lines of K space from the positive and negative lobes. So we're reading out sort of left to right and then right to left and so on and so forth. And then this slight delays that are caused by things outside of our control, like these zero eddy currents and timing, results in the shift in the sort of center or the echo of K-space between these even and odd lines. So to get rid of that, we can simply acquire data in only one direction, right? So if we acquire it only, in this case, with a positive lobe, so going left to right, we might have some sort of position shift in our echo window, but it will be consistent for all lines of k-space in, in the ky dimension. And because we have a, a consistent or a shift that's, that's consistent and not alternating, it will only lead to um, some amounts of, of, of phase in our image and it won't lead to any of these even odd line ghost artifacts. So going to a, replacing the symmetric readout with the flyback readout is, is one way to, to account for this. Like we talked about, the flyback is less SNR efficient and it leads to a longer echo time and a longer echo space. It's not really ideal here. Um, alternatively, the, the, the real common way to address this is with a so-called reference scan. Um, and this works because the Eddy currents are primarily induced by or induced from the, the large gradient strength of, the, of the, the bipolar readout gradient. So what a reference scan is, is, is it's essentially your standard acquisition without gradients on the GY or the blip axis. So what we're doing is we're acquiring the, the center line of K-space over and over and over again. Um, with this bipolar multi-echo readout. So this should be consistent um, through, through time in this sort of T dimension here. But you can see you have these, kind of see, it's kind of small here, but you can see sort of alternating zipper artifacts that show up because the um, sort of center of K-space is slightly misadjusted. It also sort of blooms out as you go through, go along the readout set sort of explains the, the sort of so-called zero and first order phase coefficients here. And because the timing delays and eddy currents are primarily introduced by the readout gradient, you can play this sort of reference scan prior to the acquisition and measure and account for this phase difference. And then by accounting for this phase difference, you can then apply it um, retrospectively to your data to sort of shift these these case based lines back so that they all have the same echo time and you don't have this sort of alternating even odd shift. And that lets you go from an image that has significant N over two ghosts to one that is then um, free of, of N over two ghosts. So on top of, of chemical shift, and on top of um, Nyquist ghosts, we also have to contend with T2 star decay or T2 star modulation of our signal during the readout. So for, for EPI or any multi-echo acquisition, our total readout duration is determined by the, the echo spacing, which again is the time between adjacent lines of K-space and the blip or the phase encode dimension, and also the echo train length, how many lines we're acquiring and a single TR. Um, and if this total time is on the order or longer than T2 star, we'll have 
significant signal decay during the readout. And this really is what limits us to, to essentially not, not having very long echo train lengths because we'll have um, significant not only chemical shift, but also T2 star signal decay during the readout. So here's a, a very simple point spread function numerical simulation on the right, um, where we have essentially a three millisecond echo space and only 16 lines of, of, of K space. So our total readout time is, is, is 48 milliseconds. And so you can see that when the, the T2 star becomes very short or starts to become shorter than our total readout time, we begin to have um, sort of T2 star blurring and shading because our signal is being heavily modulated during the readout by this T2 star decay. Um, and so based on what we've talked about um, in the sort of chemical shift artifact section with the sort of bandwidth and the frequency and then the implicit bandwidth and the phase encode, based on the direction of this artifact, can you tell you know, which direction is the, the frequency encode dimension? So let me pull this poll up real quick. So it's gonna be either the, the, the left right or in the top down. And if you had to, to guess or surmise which direction was the frequency and which direction was the phase, how would you do that? So we'll give you guys a couple minutes here to think about that and to, to answer this poll. I'll add a, a, a comment here so um, that, that might help. Um, when we were also talking about remember in, in, in fast spin echo, talked about the contra concept of, of the contrast weighting, but also the case base weighting that they would, in that case, happen due to T2 decay and across, in that case, the multiple spin echoes. So this, I would say this case is very uh, much analogous to that, um, right? That case, you looked at this weighting that happened as you did a, a different uh, uh, phase encoding lines that you get different T2 decay across the different uh, phase encoding lines. And then the general result, we, there's you can invoke Fourier theory and use convolutions, but the general result is what you see in the image is some sort of blurring artifacts. And so it's, 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 it's almost completely analogous, except instead of with T2, it's with a T2 star to this contrast weighting across case space. Give folks a few more minutes to, or a few more seconds here to, to answer. Got almost half of you guys. Yes, everyone said said top down, and that's that's perfect. That's ex ex exactly right. Um, so here again, like like Peter is saying, we have um, sort of a, a single readout that's roughly three milliseconds long in the frequency encode, but we now have this extended readout that's 48 milliseconds long in in the phase encode, and in the, in the T2 star because it's we have a longer readout will essentially. Um, primarily manifest in, in that frequency, or the, sorry, in the phase encode dimension, which is why you have blurring here in the left-right dimension. So we know frequency is this sort of top-down. And again, that's for a point spread function when you have an actual image here of, of the brain. When you start to have your T2 star much, much shorter than your, your total readout time, not, not only impacts your SNR based on echo time, but also leads to significant you know, T2 star shading and, and blurring. And so it's something to be, to be cognizant of and aware of when you not only design and set up your acquisition, um, but also in terms of your, your analysis pipeline. So what are some things we can do to, to minimize this? You know, we know that we don't wanna make our readout duration too long because it will introduce not only chemical shift, but will also introduce T2 star 
you know, signal modulation and, and sort of signal type blurring. So what are some things we can do to minimize the impact of uh, T2 star on our image for EPI? Well, the, the goal here really is to kind of keep our total readout duration as, as short as possible, right? So that can be done by increasing the bandwidth, which will reduce our echo spacing, or by increasing the number of, um, number of shots or reducing that echo train length. Both of those will serve to reduce our total readout time and will make us less um, sensitive to T2 star signal modulation. And then finally, the, the last sort of major artifact I'll talk about, but, but one of the most um, difficult to contend with is this so-called susceptibility or geometric distortion. And this is sort of a, um, an extension of the chemical shift artifact problem that we, we talked about a few slides ago. So with chemical shift, you have uh, two distinct and, and, and separate resonances um, and that sort of distinct resonance will lead to a, a bulk shift primarily in the phase encode dimension. Um, susceptibility and geometric distortion arises from either eddy currents or uh, D0 and homogeneity within your object that serve to, to sort of push in or push out in the sort of pin cushion like effect um, on your, your images. And this is because the, the both the D0 and homogeneity, uh, as well as these eddy currents from possible diffusion gradients, lead to this sort of extra accrual of, of unwanted or unaccounted for phase that results in, in distortion or shearing in your, your image. So depending on the, the direction of either the eddy currents or the, the, the magnitude or direction of your, your D0 and homogeneity, it will lead to a warping or a distortion of your image, either making it sort of compressed small or shearing it if you have sort of this linear gradient in the, the XY direction. So, you know, again, if we were trying to pose the, the question of, of which direction this would primarily occur in, it would again be primarily in the, the phasing code. So we can tell from the direction of the artifacts that our readout is, is left right and our phasing code is, is top down um, because there we're seeing primarily the, the shifts in the, the AP or top down dimension. So again, what are, what are some things we can, we can do to, to minimize the magnitude of, of this sort of geomet geometric distortion or, or, or B0 induced distortion? And the easy thing to do would be to, to do a better job shimming, right? If we can minimize the amount of, of delta B0 through our slice or through our image, we'd have less phase accrual, and we'd have less, less distortion. Um, what are some other things we can do maybe on the sort of sequence or scan parameter side to, to minimize this? Like with, with T2 star, the decay concerns, we can do a, a multi-shot approach by reducing the, 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 re reducing the echo train length and increasing the, the number of shots. We reduce our total readout time and we have less phase accrual. So as we go from a single shot to, to 16 shots, we're able to effectively totally um, remove the effects of B0 and homogeneity and kind of recovering the normal aspect of the brain seen on the right. But aside from multi-shot EPI, what other approaches could we take? Well, a common one that is essentially akin to multi-shot EPI is by employing um, parallel imaging. And so here, undersampling is just like increasing the, the number of shots and that it reduces um, the total readout time, and it reduces the, the magnitude of distortion 
um, in your image. So here in this example, as you go from a fully sampled to uh, NR over two, which is just like reducing your echo train length by a factor of two, you're able to kind of remove this sort of distorted um, squashed image and recover one that's more, more anatomically accurate. So practically, you know, how would we um, employ or combine parallel imaging with, with EPI? Um, I mean, the, the easiest approach and the one that you can see here is essentially you would, you would double the, the, the blip size to do a, a simple undersampling by a, by a factor of two. So what that would look like is that instead of acquiring sort of lines spaced like this, you would acquire half the lines with twice the step size. So here by doing it in this manner, you're able to reduce your echo train length and reduce your echo time or re reduce your um, yeah, echo train length by, by a factor of two, reducing your total readout time and making you less sensitive to things like T2 star decay and um, geometric distortion from the sort of un unwanted off resonance. So here you just would, would sample every line, and then you would use a sensor grapple-like approach to synthesize these these missing case space points and generate your your artifact-free image. You know, but but you know, EPI really is already quite fast, and so by just reducing the the echo train length and the number of shots by a factor of two, you know, may not be kind of obvious what the benefits are, and the, and the two main benefits are it reduces the the echo time, so you have a shorter readout duration and makes you less susceptible and sensitive to, to T2 star weighted blurring. And because your readout time is shorter, it also makes you less sensitive to these displacement and distortion artifacts that we were talking about on the, the prior slide. So I know Nick talked about um, parallel imaging, I think a, a lecture or two ago. So you know, one question I'll pose to you guys in the, in the form of a poll here is that um, between, you know, sense, so an image space approach or a grappa case space approach, um, which parallel imaging strategy is, is better suited for, for EPI? So I'll pull up the final poll for today and let you guys think about it. So the, I think maybe um, Nick may have, um, I'm not sure how detailed he went into the, I don't think he went detailed in the comparison of Sense and Grappa. Um, the, 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 the main difference is, is Sense is the version where you need to measure the um, sensitivity maps. Uh, that was like the, um, you know, the, the term that modulates the, the, the magnetization uh, in the signal. It, that sense you need to explicitly measure those sensitivity maps, but then you can um, just do this skipping every other line or every third line in case space. Uh, uh, grappa is, is what's called an auto calibrating technique where you estimate the correlation between the coils from the uh, from the uh, acquiring extra data in the center of K space. Uh, so, like the it would require in the diagram that 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 Jeremy has here that when you get near the center of K space, there instead of skipping every other line, you'd have to acquire. Uh, every other line at that time. That's sort of, yeah, a general grouping. There's like variations on both of these uh, techniques too. But. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, the, 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 the big difference as, as Peter points out is the grap or the case space is sort of an auto calibrating method. Um, that sort of synthesizes the missing lines in case space, whereas with sense, it requires you to acquire um, a separate 
um, coil or sensitivity profile map to be used in the reconstruction. So we've got about, and it looks about roughly half you guys have answered so far. I'll give you a few more minutes or maybe 30 more seconds to, to chime in here before we, we go through. Okay, so most of you sent, um, said the answer was, was grappa. Um, does anyone want to explain why they think grappa is the, the correct or the, the best choice to reconstruct the data here? Okay, well, so let's think about it for, for sense, right? So with sense, we acquire um, this coil profile map before the EPI acquisition from a, a low resolution image. The problem you run into with sense is that if there's any distortion or misregistration between the coil calibration step and your imaging step, you'll have sort of different amounts of distortion or misregistration between the coil profile and your undersampled echo planar images, which will cause problems in your reconstruction. And, and in contrast, um, re recon approaches like GRAPA that occur in, in K-space aren't affected by this image distortion because the, the, the reconstruction is taking place in K-space, not in image space. So, the, the proper approach to take here would be would be grappa because then you're sort of don't have to worry about the um, distortion like effects that you could have in your your undersampled echo planar images. So before I kind of settle up here, I, I wanted to talk about um, one of the potential applications for for echo planar imaging. So we talked about way back in the beginning uh, that. EPI is, is well suited to either imaging um, things like fMRI or, or first pass perfusion, where you need to have high temporal resolution, or for approaches like diffusion weighted imaging, where you need to acquire um, lots of data that would otherwise be sort of very slow and, and have onerous or very long scan times to, to acquire. So I'll put a few slides here about diffusion weighted imaging that. If you haven't already talked about, I'm sure you'll talk about more as the, the, the class goes on. So here with diffusion weighted imaging, we essentially place these, these large sort of diffusion weighted so-called gradients, these shaded gradients here on Y around the, the refocusing pulse. And what these do is they sensitize your sequence to, to sort of this motion on the, the cellular level, so-called Brownian motion. Um, the idea here is that static or unmoving spins are, are, are unaffected by these gradients because they're ostensibly refocused, but spins that move um, between the two pulses will lose some amount of signal due to this sort of random or, or, or brownian motion of, of water molecules. The more they move, the more your overall signal will be, will be reduced. Um, and this can provide some insight into both the, the cellularity as well as the composition of, of tissues. Um, and by looking at sort of, you know, water molecules that are restricted, they'll have a, a smaller diffusion coefficient and will lose less signal and it'll show up brighter on diffusion weighted imaging or images. And so the magnitude here of your diffusion weighting is, is characterized by, by the B value. The greater the separation between these gradients and the greater, the stronger the gradient strength, um, the more sensitive you'll be to any sort of um, Brownian motion and the more signal you'll lose. And by acquiring data at multiple B values or multiple diffusion weighting strengths, you can then sort of quantify this sort of diffusion weighted decay to extract the so-called diffusion coefficient, um, which quantifies how far the water molecules can move or, or how restricted they are. Um, so, Free water will have the, the highest ADC or apparent diffusion coefficient, 
or move the most really because it's the most unrestricted. Um, in contrast, high cell density will lead to, to restricted diffusion where the water molecules will move less on average. So in other words, you know, ADC really is, is inversely correlated with, with cellularity. Um, this can be used to, to assess or be a sign of malignant disease as tumors can oftentimes be um, highly prolifer proliferative and have high cell density. So, you know, if we take this example of the prostate, for, ex for example, acquired at D0, so no diffusion weighting, and it'd be a 1500, so relatively high amounts of diffusion weighting. Um, we, we can see at the high, high B value or high diffusion weighting, we see this sort of bright, hyper intense signal here. That's because the water is, is in this lesion more restricted, making it easier to, to pick up and visualize on the, the high B value images and making it potentially easier to stratify the disease. Um, and along with T2 weighted imaging in, in DCE, this is one of the ways in which MR is used to stratify um, and identify prostate cancer. Um, this can also be extended to, to this concept of diffusion tensor imaging. Um, before we were looking at sort of diffusion weight and diffusion gradients on a, a single axis, um, but DTI applies them along multiple axes. And you can see kind of the, the rationale for it by looking at this sort of simple sort of spheroid or, or, or columnar cross section here. Um, depending on the direction that you apply these diffusion gradients, it can either have a, a small or, or restricted amount of diffusion, or it can have essentially unrestricted or, or free diffusion. And so by acquiring multiple B values in multiple directions, you're able to, to quantify um, the directions in, 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 all three, in all three axes. And so you can generate these maps that are no longer really dependent on the specific orientation of, of the gradients, um, but rather mul measures multiple directions to quantify this sort of anisotropy or the, the angularness of, of the, in this case, the brain. Um, and it's commonly used to, well, here you would acquire it with both without and then with at least six diffusion directions to, to acquire this DTI data. And so you can see that as you go from a single 2D slice to multi-slice or volumetric and need to acquire multiple D values in multiple directions, it would take uh, an inordinately long amount of, of, of time to acquire this data, which is why echoplanar imaging is, is, is commonly used to accelerate and make this, this acquisition um, feasible in, in a clinical, clinically, clinically relevant amount of, uh, amount of scan time. So to summarize and kind of key points to, to take away here, um, EPI is one of the, the fastest ways you can acquire data with conventional MRI. And here you can get down to the scan times that are under 100 milliseconds per slice. And you're able to really to capture and isolate any motion. And so you can generate images that are <clears throat> free of, of cardiac or respiratory motion artifacts. And this gives you um, very short scan times with the capability for very high temporal resolution. Um, and this short scan time is really critical when trying to image things that move fast, so like first pass perfusion imaging or cardiac imaging, or when it would take a long time to acquire the data otherwise. And this really is a, a, an approach that's a mainstay of clinical imaging, and so it's used commonly for diffusion weighted and diffusion tensor imaging, but also for perfusion imaging, MRA, and, and fMRI. Uh, but it does have some, some downsides. Like we talked about it, it's rather prone to distortion, both from diffusion weighted gradients, but also primarily from D0 and homogeneity. Um, and it's also sensitive to off resonance. So if we, we need to come up with some way to either minimize that distortion or more commonly um, come up with a way to selectively excite water with minimum uh, fat excitation. And one thing to note too is that um, because we're trying to traverse case space in the minimum possible time, we're oscillating these gradients um, at nearly the, the, the maximum gradient strength, the maximum slew rate. And so this can induce um, peripheral nerve stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation due to these oscillating um, readout gradients. And so it's something to be, to be cognizant of and aware of in these types of sequences. So 
for further reading, you know, along from with the book you have, there's a, a nice summary chapter in the handbook of MR pulse sequences, as well as a nice book by uh, Derek Jones on diffusion MRI. And so chapter 12 has got a good overview there. Um, beyond that, you know, my, my email address is below. I'm happy to, to answer any questions you guys might have about EPI, either now or if any other questions come up at a later point in time, feel free to, to email. And I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss and, and, and talk further there. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, does anybody have any, any questions right now for Jeremy? Um, yeah, well, that was great. I think, um, you know, this, I'll, I'll reemphasize a couple points that like really, um, EPI is, is one of, is a widely used workhorse kind of pulse sequence for, uh, particularly in the brain for doing diffusion uh imaging and, and increasingly in the body too but doing diffusion imaging and fmri in the brain i mean and any sort of um neuroscience or uh study that's using fmri i mean those are all going to be using epi so there's a huge huge impact to uh the pulse sequences here um and we'll hear some more about a couple of you know things related to this uh, there's a group uh, 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 Gavin and Tanner, who are doing DTI for their projects, so we'll hear some more about them for that from them. Um, and then in um, Monday's lecture, I'll talk a little bit more about um, tissue suppression techniques, which is chapter 25 uh, in the textbook, where um, we'll go into more detail about like the fat suppression pulses that. Um, that uh, Jeremy mentioned as a way to you know, get rid of the chemical shift uh, artifact and, and to talk a little bit more about those strategies too. So you'll get, a, get to hear a little bit more and, and reinforce some of that. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about, or, or, or maybe depending on the time, maybe post a lecture, but on, on fMRI as well, just to, to um, since uh, nobody's covering that for their project and that's again, one of the, a key, uh, key, uh, yeah, contrast mechanism in MRI. Um, okay. Um, the, and I forgot one more announcement. I'm gonna, um, I previously sent out a poll about the time to do the final project presentations. Um, um, I, I will, I may actually have to, to change the times on that slightly, but I'm going to um, try to send that out uh, again and uh, uh, figure out, I need to make sure to find a time that, that everybody can be present for some or uh, you know, part or all of that um, window so you can do your presentations. And, um, and since uh, next week we'll be covering in the tissue suppression a little bit more as sort of the last piece of material that, that might be on the exam. And then I wanna devote the Wednesday session to be like a more of an overall course review. Uh, I need to find a time on, on Friday that could work for, for everyone to do your presentations. Um, and then, um, yeah, since we have a uh, that have extra time in the lecture slot here. Um, I can stick around and answer questions either on the material or homeworks projects. Um, and uh, but um, and so I, I'll stick around in the Zoom room until uh, two thirty. Um, and um, thanks again, uh, Jeremy, for the lecture, and we'll 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 post the uh, the. The recording and 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 his slides on the website as well. Thanks again, Jeremy. No problem. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Feel free Thank to you. email if y'all have any questions. Thank you.